Welcome to the talk show Promising Bangladesh, sponsored by Crown Cement. And this is Sinha M. Saeed anchoring this very show. Well, viewers, today our point of discussions are visa policy and its extension gradually and rules and regulations about the rallies and assemblies within the campus of Supreme Court and courts in Bangladesh. And finally, latest standing of BNP anomaly. And to discuss about the old things, we have invited to a special guest. One is on my right, Barrister M. Sarwar Hussain, lawyer, Supreme Court of Bangladesh, and he joined Convener of Bangladesh Nationalist Movement. Well, Mr. Sarwar, how are you? Fine, thank you. Well, we have another guest. He is Professor Farad Hussain. He is a political analyst at the same time, member election committee of Awami League. Well, Mr. Farad, how are you? Thank you, sir. I am fine. And what's about you, sir? Fine. Well, let us discuss the whole thing. Well, Mr. Sarwar Hussain, you are a lawyer. And you know very well the Supreme Court and the courts of Bangladesh is a very sacred place indeed. In 2005, during the time of Khaled Aziz administration, there is a directive from the High Court. There should be no rallies and assemblies and demonstration on the campus and premises. But we have seen in 2023, there is another directive from the Supreme Court. They ban any kind of assemblies, rallies on the campus and ask the lawyers to strictly follow the directives. But we have seen, we are still arranging the whole thing. There is no, nobody is taking note of it. Why all this is taking place on the campus? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, ma for inviting me in your program. And I also thank my uh, co-discussant. Uh, on your question, uh, you know that uh, I am a practicing lawyer in the Supreme Court of Bangladesh. Uh, earlier, I was in Bangladesh Army. I switched my profession. I took volunteer retirement and uh, did law from University of London. And I am a member of Honorable Society of Lincoln Sin. Whatever we have learned uh, from this common law country, uh, in practice, uh, hardly 10 percent can be implemented. The uh, custom and etiquettes, rules and regulations, the practice norms, the standard of the lawyers, the standard of the professionalism, uh, it looks like that it has gone to the bottom. Uh, from the deteriorating point, uh, now the campus, now the premises of Supreme Court look like a campus of university. Uh, we three, all we had been the student of Dhaka University. Well, in the university, there can be procession, there can be agitations, because that is the place of, place to practice democracy. Supreme Court also a place of, uh, to practice democracy, but in the Supreme Court, the highest court of the country is a place of sanctity is a place of professionalism, a place of justice. Unfortunately, uh, uh, these political regimes, if you compare from 1991, many says that there was new beginning for democracy, but the standard of governments, the standard of democracy, the standard of leadership has deteriorated uh, too, too low, too low. Uh, that everything has deteriorated and Supreme Court itself is not a isolated island. So, the political uh, naughtiness, the substandard of political culture has definitely has the spillover effect in Supreme Court. And the, you see the standard of judgment, the standard of um, rule of law, the standard of appointing of the justices, uh, this all has the political influence. In 2010, there were a enrollment uh, uh, as justice and many of them had third classes in both SSC, ACC and even someone has three third classes. So, you see the standard. So, this type of enrollment could take place because of the political influence. So, in many countries in the world, uh, uh, the, the manipulation is direct disqualification. 
manipulation for a post is considered direct disqualifications. And in Bangladesh, in many places and also in the Supreme Court, when the authority appointed judges, the manipulations becomes a big factor that he is my person, he is my person, he comes from my chamber. So, they have to, uh, they have to be ele elevated as justices. So, this is on side. The another side, the politicization of the whole thing. So, this enrollment procrea has a politicization in the in the enrollment, in the enhancement of uh, the system of judiciary. So, the judiciary has the two sides, bench and bar. The standard should be equal. If the on, on, on part is politicized and the other side is bound to, policy, to be policy, politicized. So, this has seriously affected the whole environment and that is why there are agitation and there are demonstration taking place violating all the rules, regulations and there is also a judgment as I know. So, they do not care anything. So, these rules and regulations not only being denied in the premises of Supreme Court, it is denied in many places. We hear that many judgment, many many judgment are not at all complied by the government machinery, come by the administration. Come to again because we are talking about the campus, in yes. uh, Supreme Court campus, Junior Minister's Courts campus. Well, Mr. Farah Hussain, you learned so many things from the very mouth of Barrister Sarovar Hussain. And you are a teacher basically, also allied with the political party, I mean the ruling Awamili. What is your impression about the whole thing? Yes, uh, uh, I would like to exactly give my opinion particularly on the situation of the premises which is going on right now in the Supreme Court premises. It is very important that Supreme Court is the guardian, the custodian of the constitution of the republic and constitution is the supreme law of the republic. And the, since Supreme Court is the custodian of the constitution, I think that the premises of Supreme Court should be maintained properly so that it could not be polluted by any sort of unexpected demonstrations, procession like this. And you know that the lawyers have got a certain kind of commitment exactly to continue the law and situation properly and to execute the judicial matter particularly in the superior court. And that is why I think that eth ethically lawyers should not have any sort of demonstration or agitation in the court. And if it is so, the country, the people of the country, common people will take, uh, 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 will not take a very positive impression about the court, about, about the Supreme Court of the Republic. This is very important. And now what is going on? I think that in Bangladesh, there are so many unpleasant things are going on. And I think that the present situation prevailing in the Supreme Court in so many ways, you know, and we have come to know also the door of the Supreme Courts have been kicked by some lawyers. I don't like to mention, though I know their names, but I don't like to mention their names. But it is a serious, I think, that uh, indecent behavior, particularly to the Superior Court of the Republic. How an advocate exactly can do that? particularly uh, uh, do that in the Supreme Court premises, which will create a very, very negative impression and people of different levels and different professions are gossiping about it. When the enlightened people exactly are found this sort of situation in the co Supreme Court, they are found very helpless because the Supreme Court is the ultimate resort particularly to get justice, morality and ethics. And that is why I think that the uh, honorable lawyers uh, should restrain themselves to do that particularly so they should have the responsibility so that the premises of the Supreme Court uh, cannot be polluted by this sort of ill practices, indecent practices. Thank you very much. Barista Sarwar, you know very well if there is any verdict from the court, should there be any hesitation and demonstration on the very campus against it or they should go for appeal to the higher court? Is it violation? Instead of going to the court, you are demonst demonstrating, railing, assembling. How can you ensure the free and fair atmosphere 
in the court. Uh, the onus uh, uh, burden is upon the bar and bench for both the parties. Uh, the bar has the responsibility led by Chief Justice to uphold the environment and respect and honor as uh, it has written in the constitution. The, the, the respect and the honor has to be upheld and kept uh, by the Chief Justice. You know there are many sumoto rules is being issued by in many countries if something goes wrong. So, the Chief Justice just issuing a sumoto rule can solve this problem. So, the, the order, the what, order direction what, what and… What type of sumoto rules? Those you, those you have violated this judgment and rules, they should be brought to justice. Now, there are reasons for this demonstration, there are reasons, but you must maintain the decency as well. You know, there was a visiting team uh, from European Union just before two months and they went to call on attorney general. When they were coming out, they were agitation in a manner that they, they are touching their bodies. Look so hard. Yes, you can hesitate. You can hesitate, but you show also the standard. You also show the uh, show show your decency. So this type of hesitation usually is not bringing anything. No result, actually, because the environment or the standard of the judgment of judiciary is a uh, is direct fallout of the. Uh, administration, di direct uh, political culture comes in. So, I said that you said that Chief Justice, new Chief Justice who has been just promoted, uh, elevated, he has taken a uh, public reception arranged by ruling party. So, now anybody can question, uh, uh, should he or does the spirit of law, does the spirit of judiciary permit him to do so? he could do because he has a very influential position in the ruling party. People will view like that. And that program in uh, Netrokona, I believe, uh, was organized by the political party. So, this is a new example he has set already. Bad or good will be discussed for the time to come. So, I feel the uh, people may view it the, with this view how he is going to deliver fair justice, their question may come in. So, is it the shifting, the rituals, the standard is shifting. Another big problem in Supreme Court is corruption. The place, the room you deliver the justices, sitting in that same room, the bribing is going on, it is not today much before for decades together. It has, it has been written in the book, there had been procession, there had been human chain to stop this corruption. Every chief justice is coming to the office and vote to corrupt, to curb this corruption. But at the end of the term, nothing has developed. This chief justice, I give him a thanks, he has realized that the corruption has spread it like cancer in Bangladesh, including Supreme Court. So, people will see what actions he is going to take to curb this corruption. Well, to my understanding, if he, if he bring to the justice only top 20 corrupt people, 80 percent of the corruption can be curbed automatically. Thank you. Now, we will see whether as he has realized that corruption has spread like cancer, now the people of Bangladesh will see what action as a chief justice is going to do. Thank you very much uh, for your very, very thoughtful touch on the matter. Well, we are going for a short break and come to you very soon. Viewers, we are going for a short break and please keep watching. We are back to again to the talk show Promise Bangladesh sponsor by Councilment. And we were having talks with Barrister Sarwar Hussain and Professor Farad Hussain. And now our next question is to Mr. Farad Hussain. 
you know very well many things are going to take place centering the visa policy. And every day we are getting new and redefined explanations. And do you think the visa policy really <coughs> created a reign of terror for those who are really victim or are the would, would be victims? Thank you, Senabai, for your question. And visa policy of the United States of America has already become a very buzzword, particularly in the sky of Dhaka. And I already told about it in several talk shows, either in Bangla and in English also, you know. And one of the talk shows, which is very, has already been famous, particularly under ABC television, and which you are anchoring, I have mentioned it very clearly. The visa policy of the United States of America has become a very buzzword. But I think that visa policy is going on in a very, very, I mean, that uh, indisciplined way. The American government is imposing visa policy on him, on her, on institutions, on organizations, and government offices, government offices, etc., etc. The expansion of the visa policy is going to be so wide that I uh, gradually I think that the visa restri restrictions by the United States of America on Bangladesh is losing exactly its gravity, its importance, I would like to say. And now I am exactly provoked to think about it, why the American government is found very apt exactly to impose visa policy on a country like Bangladesh. The, my thinking is strictly motivated with a certain kind of feeling that the, Ameri Ameri that, that the United States of America has got a particular far-reaching sentiment and views and ideas. What is this? You know, China has become a very agitating figure, particularly in Asian region, you know. And it was a very long time anticipation of the United States of America towards China. They could exactly anticipate by an experiment of the American foreign policy, American defense, defense strategy, that China would be once upon a time a serious challenge, particularly on the way of the United States of America, America's expansion of influence, particularly in the Asian region. That is a very important thing. And you know that in the election of, 19, uh, election of 2014 and election of 2018, yes, there are so many controversial uh, speech exactly have come already, particularly on those two elections, you know. The American government was found kept silent during the time. They did not feel any urge to impose any visa policy like this. But now, why American government is found very hasty to impose visa, visa election in a very indiscriminating way, I should say. And that is why I am exactly, I am under a certain kind of speculation over the visa policy of the United States of America. It is that, the time exactly for, since, 19, uh, since 2018 to right now, there is a particular change, qualitative change has already been created in global politics. And global politics, the picture of the global politics clearly speaks to the United States of America that China has been an unparalleled force, not only in Asia, but also it has become a very serious challenge, a monster particularly to the expansion of the influence of the United States of America, not only in Asia, but, the, uh, but China is exactly taking the target to, ex to capture the market of the European region, and they are doing so. And that is why Bangladesh has become a very important land, though the periphery of the land of Bangladesh is smaller than any other country. But thing is that geopolitical importance, particularly for the location of Bangladesh, having the touch of Bay of Bengal and other strategic areas, you know, and particularly the northeast border of India, Bangladesh is locating in a very particular strategic position. And that is why in order to get a certain kind of convenient position for the United States of America, America is taking a certain kind of measure through a visa policy to take Bangladesh in the side of the United States of America very strictly let me let me let me give me only uh, 30 seconds to take Bangladesh in her side so that he could America could exactly create a very strong wall on the face of China thank so you. that China could not exactly make an expansion uh, primarily in Asian region thank you very much Mr. Farhad Hussain already uttered the word America is trying to take the issue to his own side for its own interest. What are your observations? Uh, thank you very much uh, for this point. Uh, 
Uh, definitely, I agree that um, uh, the whole American interest uh, in this region, including Bangladesh, is geopolitical. Uh, you see, in uh, 1848, the then Foreign Secretary of UK uh, said that the, uh, there is no permanent friend or enemy in foreign policy. It is the perpetual interest, which is the last word. So, that is the bottom line of any country's foreign policy. So, America today uh, under the Biden uh, administration, human rights is their center point, human rights and democracy. So, you know, you know that they have enacted a act called Burma Act. So, they do not call Myanmar Burma Act. So, the, their whole geopolitical issue is to contain China. As my core discussion has already said that yeah. So, they will do their role by using their various tools and one of the tools is visa policy, the other tools are sanction and many other many other things. So, the Bangladeshi people are liking this visa restriction. And every day they are looking for who who has fallen under this visa restriction. Some politician already said that I heard that my name is there. So this visa restriction, the play field has been created by this poor leadership of our politicians. If they come to the sense that let us solve our own problem, as long you cannot solve your own problem, they will intervene. They will look for their own interest, and the people of Bangladesh and the country will suffer. Thank you very much, Mr. Sarwar. For Mr. Farah Hussain, Mr. Sarwar has categorically emphasized the poor leadership responsible for all these things. And how would you define all these things being a member of our league? Yes, I'd like to uh, uh, talk something about Indian politics. And Sarwar Bhai, Mr. Sarwar Bhai told something about India. And I have got a little bit of experience about Indian politics. And he said about Indira doctrine, and there is a doctrine also, Gujral doctrine. You know, the Gujral doctrine is a participatory, participatory doctrine, you know. And I think that the two trend of doctrines are going on in India. A large number of people exactly in, in intellectual level and in journalists and professors, and thinkers, and think tanks, they are also talk, uh, talking and thinking about it. What would be the, what would be the fittest political stand of India? Exactly. Either it is a Gujral doctrine or Indira doctrine, whatever it is. But I'd like to assure you, Sarwar Bhai, Bangladesh is a matured country, you know. Bangladesh had, has got the experience of colonial rule, you know, in two ways. In, in uh, uh, 190 years under British Raj, and then 23 or 4 years under Pakistani government. The Pakistan, Indian Bangladeshi leadership could know how to face exactly any sort of imposition of anything particularly on a sovereign country like Bangladesh. So we don't care for any doctrine, either it is Indira doctrine or Guzal doctrine. I think that there are so many particular experience present in our political party, Awami League, you know, they could, they know how to defend exactly the interest of Bangladesh. I'd like to cite an example, particularly in this connection. I'd like to talk about corridors. Yes, corridors, you know, uh, 151 corridors. And when the corridor settlement exactly had brought in the scenario, you know, that Bangladesh has owned 100, 101 corridors, India has owned only 50 corridors. I'd like to say it was a long disputing issue, particularly in Pakistan politics. Nawabja the Liyakut Ali Khan, the first Prime Minister of Pakistan, could not solve it. And then Mohammed Ali Bogra could not solve it. Nazimuddin, Khaza Nazimuddin could not solve it. Ismail Ibrahim Chandigarh could not solve it. And Saar Firuz Khanun could not solve it at all. You know that it is our leader, Prime Minister, present Prime Minister uh, Sheikh Hasina, exactly, uh, had been able to solve it with a greater share, you know. And not only that, during the time of Awami League, you know, that the maritime boundary had been settled down, which was, which had been a very disputing issue for a long time. 
well, in Mr. Bangladesh politics. Professor so I am serious. I, I am fully confident in the ability of the politicians of Awami League. Well, uh, there are so many leaders exactly who have got the far-reaching sentiment, particularly how to handle the situation coming on I will in come Bangladesh. To you. And thank okay. you very much. Well, Professor Farad, we'll come to you again because we are talking in very, very important issues. And viewers, we're going for a short break. Please keep staying with us. Viewers, we are back to the talk show Promise Bangladesh, sponsored by Crown Cement. And we are having talks with Barrister Sarwar Hussain and Professor Farad Hussain. Both are very, very expert and they're dealing with a very critical issues like India doctrine and Guzal doctrine. Barrister Sarwar, this is the first time in the talk show that such a wonderful doctrines are coming. You know very well the difference between the Guzal doctrine and India doctrine. We say India <coughs> doctrine, it is Rajiv doctrine, it is basically Nehru doctrine. Yes. And opposed to it, Guzal says no, India should behave properly with the neighbors. Yes. So, how do you think in the context of the present time? Uh, well, uh, 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 apparently, there are many doctrines and now they follow the doctrine that neighbor first. Though their foreign policy uh, spokesman is said that now India is following the neighbor first policy, but does their activities or a process reflect that? Excuse their me, this is also the policy of Xi Jinping. Yes. Same thing. Yes, yeah, same thing. So. Uh, if you, if you view their activities and a process with the neighbors, you see that predominantly that India doctrine is coming off in their behavior. And in many occasions, in many talks, I have said, my friends in India have a basic fault in the concept of their foreign policy. Their concept derived from Chanukko or Koitullo his famous, famous or infamous book, Orthoshastro, where they have defined neighbor in two categories. Category number one, either enemy, and category number two, or slave. There is no friendly state in their concept. Could India come out of that age old, outdated, unfriendly, unconducive, foreign policy process? I don't think. In contrast, after Second World War, America gave an idea to Western Europe to rebuild after World War II, Marshall policy. The concept of Marshall policy was that region as a whole developed economically and economic viability saved their, ensured their security. So, by the Marshall policy, the Western Europe as a whole has developed and still they follow democracy, rule of law, human rights, etc. And anybody you ask that if he wish to migrate either, either North America or West Europe, they will prefer. They criticize, they can criticize sitting in the land of West Europe or Northern America they will criticize, again they prefer to go there, as I said earlier. So, in contrast, um, India uh, wish to uh, be the regional power or, uh, or the global player, they could not maintain harmonious and friendly relations with the neighbors. I do not think that with this wrong concept of foreign policy, they can really uh, fulfill their aspiration to become the regional power or global player. First of all, you have to see that you can accommodate your neighbors. To Bangladesh, you see one of the high commissioner of India to Bangladesh visiting Aumilik office said that we have only friend Aumiliks. India has only friends Aumiliks. This is their foreign policy. And what Pranav Mukherjee has written in his book, you see. So, by their approaches, by their conduct, by their behavior, they have to prove that they have shifted 
drifted away from the Indriya doctrine to Gujral doctrine interacted or a foreign relations, neighboring relations with reciprocity. They could not show that. You see, uh, Maldives, a tiny country, the, a newly elected president is anti-Indian. The only Hindu country, Nepal, is not under influence of India. Why you like to influence? You make friendly relations. You don't show hegemony. You don't, uh, your approach should not indicate that your behavior is like big brother. That the people does not like, na people of the neighboring countries does not like that. And nobody like that. So Pakistan is a declared enemy country. And other neighbors, they do not have good relations. It is only Bangladesh, they could implement the second version, uh, either enemy or slave. So the official status of Bangladesh is slave. In their foreign policy, this concept is still there. They have not officially uh, uh, derogated that. They have not officially declared, uh, rejected that. To my knowledge, I don't know. So their approach has to be like that, that neighbors first or Gujral doctrine that we mean the reciprocal relations with the neighboring country. How come you dictate a election or democracy in Bangladesh, <coughs> a foreign secretary comes to this country and dictate the terms and condition of the election. So why don't you understand that a, a unstable Bangladesh do not come to your advantage. A unstable Bangladesh come to your negative. Thank negative you very much. I will come to so you. So you have to realize that. I, I so Indian, the, the people of India yeah, yeah. must realize that. Yeah. Well, Barisha Sarovar, thank you very much. We will come to you again. Thank you. Well, Mr. Farad Hussain, <coughs> you heard what Mr. Barisha Sarovar said and he's eloquently and mm -hmm. deliberately with and emphatically raised so many issues on India doctrine and Guzal doctrine and explained in such a manner which is really interesting. I'd like to exactly make a very impartial uh, discussion, particularly on Indian foreign policy. You know that uh, Jawaharlal Nehru exactly handled the Indian foreign policy during his three, ten years as prime minister, you know. And very important thing is that, very interesting, he did not appoint any foreign minister during whole 17 years, during his tenure as prime minister. And there are so many reasons for this, I'd like to mention it. One thing is that he did not find any particular di expert diplomat to handle the uh, foreign policy during the time or external affairs. And that is why he was very flexible uh, for himself exactly to handle the foreign policy of India during that time. You know, Nehru was hated. Nehru was hated and seriously, harshly criticized by so many Indians for his three things. Number one, he was proposed by the United States of America, especially Dwight Eisenhower and his foster dollars, his Secretary of State, exactly to accept the permanent membership in the Security Council of the United Nations Organization, but Nehru refused. And also Rush, Russia proposed India to accept the membership of the Security Council of the United States of America. And it was the objectives of objectives of both the United States of America and Russia to make a blockade over China. Because China was enjoying the monopoly power, particularly monopoly power of exercising veto power in the Security Council of the United States of America from the Asian region. So the two countries wanted to exactly place two opponents before China. And other thing is that Nehru used to believe in idiosyncratic foreign policy and which exactly spirited him and inspired him not to be inclined to any superpower, particularly in Cold War situation. He wanted to handle the Cold War situation in a very careful way. And that is why he used to believe in non-aligned movement and punch shella, uh, number one. And number two is that Nehru was not care uh, careful about Chinese impending attack or Chinese sentiment and psyche. Many politicians during them anticipated the Chinese had attack from China, exactly, at any time. But Nehru could not believe it. He used to believe in Panch Shela, the five principles on which it, the relation between China and mm -hmm. India was based. Nehru used to believe it. When in 1962 it was an abrupt attack from China, Nehru was surprised 
and it was reported that during the time China, I, I, Indian Defense Minister was Krishna Bannon. He was not properly informed. And uh, Lieutenant General Timaya, the second man of Indian, uh, uh, sorry, he was the first man, perhaps, no first man, he was almost the retired general. I'm not sure, but he also exactly very much careful and reported Nehru that uh, an attack might come, particularly from China's side. And not only that, the Defense Minister Krishnamayana did not inform this. Mm -hmm. Then Commander-in-Chief P.N. Thapar, P.N. Thapar, Pranna Thapar, General P.N. Thapar was commanding India in 1962. His son, Karan Thapar, was the stalwart journalist in India right now. Is anchoring in a television program, you know. And Nehru was not careful at all. And when ne China attacked, China attacked India, Ch India had to face a very catastrophic experience. Within seven days, exactly, Lost. India had faced so many, so lost so many troops, so many, uh, uh, so many officers, you know. And I was surprised to see the names of the officers who died in Sino-Indian War in New Delhi. Well, I was in a delegation. So I think that Nehru had a particular policy not to make any sort of pressure on any neighboring country. Other thing is that Nehru was proposed to accept Nepal. But Nehru did not accept Nepal to be assimilated in Indian territory. So I think that Nehru was a stalwart statesman who used to believe in non-aligned spirit. And that is why during his time, he was not found to be inclined to any superpower during. And I, in this uh, show, anchored by Sina by you, and I would like to take the privilege to pay my homage and tribute to Jawaharlal Nehru, the first prime minister of independent India. Okay, Professor Faraz, thank you very much for your animated, dis animated discussions. Well, Mr. Barrister Sarwar, what is your overall understanding about the talk show in general? Thank you very much again. Uh, uh, look, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, I am also impressed uh, by his statesmanship. In Bangladesh, we see the political leader who cannot go, who cannot overpass the individual and political party interest. A statesman is the leader of a nation look for the next generation, next century, and bring spanship, take the nations further. Likuan, you bring the, from Fisherman Island to First World, the first approach was bring the best people into the politics. Jawaharlal Nehru was a leader of that height. I have studied his two books, The Discovery of India and the Glimpses of world history. It's an amazing book to study. Yes. The young generations today, the Facebook generation, the smartphone generation, I would suggest read this book, understand the world politics, un understand the subcontinental politics, where we are. This nation suffers from leadership crisis. Those leaders so far has administered Bangladesh are the political leaders. I admire President Jia. For that, I may take the discussion again to reply this. But I found the leadership quality in him. And you know, uh, I was a member of Bangladesh Nationalist Party. I left because the present leadership <coughs> of BNB could not attract me. And I understand that the national interest and the people's interest are not protected in their hand. No way. I am not convinced. So, we have founded a new political party called Bangladesh Nationalist Movement and we have distinguished in five factors from the present political party. First, nobody to held a political appointment more than two terms. The term will be of three years. There, there cannot be the term of prime minister more than two terms. If the term of the president for two terms, why the prime minister should be for unlimited time? And in Bangladesh politics, you see the national leadership is not coming because the big parties holding the political position for 35 years, 40 years, where from the national leadership will come? Short so we is. said, yeah, I, I shot it. We said that there will be a, 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 a corruption-free party. In these present political parties, 
there is no no steps against corruption within the party and out of the party. Thank you very much, Barista Sarwar. You spoke very well. Well, this is time to go for ending. Viewers, we are going to end this session <coughs> and before that, I would like to summarize the talks held here. You know very well, both of them are very expert and eloquently they defined what they believe and what they understand about the whole thing. And both of them of the same mind about the leadership and statesmanship. And at this very moment, Bangladesh is seriously suffering from these two areas. At the same time, they believe Bangladesh should have relations with the India especially. India is now imbued and crowned with the two doctrines, Gujarat doctrines and Nehru doctrines or say India doctrine or you can say India doctrine. Both the doctrines are their own doctrine. But for Bangladesh, we need a doctrine which needs, we must keep our head ongoing. We are not subservient to any powers. We are not subservient to any blocks. We are what we are. And that is the message to you. And thank you very much. We will meet you again. Thank you.